Good evening all. It gives me actually very much pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Richa Kothari. And she is consultant cardiac thoracic radiologist, Narayan Institute of Cardiac Science, Bangalore. And she is going to give you a lecture class on the role of cardiac MRI in day-to-day -day practice. Hearty welcome to Dr. Richa to the Saturday's Kerala ERA faculty program. And also warm welcome to Dr. Gomadi Subramaniam, State President, Dr. Rijo, State Secretary, Dr. Ramesh Henai, Program Coordinator, and Dr. Avani K.P. Skandan. And Dr. Avani is the moderator of today's program. I welcome you all. And also I extend my welcome to the all Mindra team who is going, <clears throat> actually who is giving us the, this platform. And welcome each one of you who is attending this academic program on behalf of myself and also on behalf of the entire Kerala IRA. And now over to Dr. Gomadi Subramaniam for opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Venu, and good evening to all of you. Uh, we are in the Mindray platform, uh, doing very well uh, for the last sessions. And uh, today, again, we are with the cardiovascular system. And uh, we have a wonderful talk last Wednesday with the residents. And today, we are going to have a good lecture, which will be very useful for the residents, because always I say that cardio... Uh, cardiac imaging is often neglected. The residents never read uh, the cardiac imaging or the even the chapter in the CVS is never read by the residents. So I wanted to give importance for the cardiology uh, session and all the residents should be aware of what all the anomalies and all the pathologies coming under cardiovascular system. That's why we are doing this session and whole February month is cardiovascular system and we are coming to the end of the session next week so we'll have a few more topics and today we have a wonderful session by Dr. Richa. So I welcome everybody to hear the talk. Over to you Avni. Thank you so much ma'am. Good evening everybody. Uh, like already Dr. Venu sir and Dr. Gomuthi ma'am have already briefed. We are having this entire month on cardiac MRI and to be uh, on cardiac uh, imaging and it's very difficult to, you know, we have very limited number of cardiothoracic radiologists, very few. You can just kind of, you know, just count them on your fingers, that kind of uh, number they have. We don't have a good exposure. So even getting one of them is very difficult. And Dr. Richa has been very, very courteous. At the last minute, I went and asked her and she was like very helpful and uh, supportive. She took a session on Wednesday with her PGs or her fellows. And that was an amazing session. It was very useful for the PGs and for all of us. It was a great session. So about Dr. Richa Kothari, she has uh, done her DNB and she has her level three um, MR certification, cardiac MR certification from European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging. And as for her uh, credentials, of course, she is a consultant cardiothoracic radiologist at Narayan Institute of Cardiac Sciences, Bangalore. Her areas of expertise, again, obviously, is cardiac CT and MR, not restricted to adults, but also to children. And she is interested in thoracic and vascular imaging. She had won the regional award uh, by the European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging uh, for this uh, MR, cardiac MR in Barcelona in Spain. She is a co-author of multiple textbook chapter, speaker at various national and international conferences, conducted several cardiac imaging CMEs and workshops for doctors and technicians both. She has been a winner of multiple research presentations at national and international level. She's an executive committee member of the Indian Association of Cardiac Imaging and also part of the DNP teaching program. And today she's going to present to us uh, something not like the regular topics that we expect, but she's going for a very broader view, which is actually going to be very helpful for all of us because she's going to be talking about role of cardiac MR in day-to-day -day practice. Something like we already mentioned, we are not used to. So it is right, the basics, it is just to improve our perspective. It gives us the entire perspective. Rather than limiting herself to a topic, she's taken a wonderful topic that is going to help each one of us. So looking forward to your brilliant talk, Dr. Richa, as usual. 
So I welcome Dr. Richa to the session. Dr. Richa, what Hello, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. We have a small uh, session for two minutes. I'm sorry. Yes. Can we do My that? had a small session prior to that. Yes, yes, yes. Over to you, Shivangi. Hey, hello, everyone. I'm Shivangi Trivedi from Mindray. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Okay, your camera is off. <clears throat> Yeah, but can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can. Okay. Uh, so I'll be talking a small, taking a small session about lung ultrasound today, right? Uh, in last 15 years, we have got a new imaging application with sonography that is the lung ultrasound. From the traditional assessment of uh, pleural effusion and masses, lung ultrasound has come a long way and helped us in different critical scenarios like uh, lung edema as well as the e, uh, pneumothorax. And in coming future, maybe lung ultrasound is likely to be a very important and integral part of emergency medicine as well as the ICUs. So the places where uh, the traditional approach that we follow for lung examination is first the physical examination, which, has insufficient, uh, which is insufficient for final diagnosis. Second is the bedside chest radiography, which has limited accuracy. Third is the chest computed tomography. And final is the lung ultrasound. Lung ultrasound has a better diagnostic accuracy than physical examination as well as chest radiography combined. So these are the places where lung ultrasound can be really helpful to us. That is the pleural pathology, pericardial pathology, shortness of breath, sinuses, cough, as well as shock condition. And the probes that we use for lung ultrasound is convex, linear, as well as we can use phase direct. Now in ultrasound, we generally say artifacts are bad, but for lung ultrasound, it is all about the study of the artifacts. And that's how we do lung sonography. Now this is how your normal lung looks. These are all, uh, this is the plural line. These are the rib shadows. And this A lines that you see are normal. They are generated because of the reverberation artifacts. Uh, created by the pleural lines. And whenever there is a lung edema, the reverberation artifacts the, create this kind of vertical B lines, which indicates that patient has the lung edema. So the horizontal lines are normal, but the vertical lines are what indicates the lung edema. Also, in case of pneumothorax, like in normal lung, this is how we see the M mode uh, uh, image, where we can see a seashore sign. But in a case of pneumothorax, there is no motion, lung motion, and that's why we see this barcode sign. So this is how we differentiate between the normal lung as well as the pneumothorax. Now, without going much deep into the clinical scenario, I would just like to highlight one mind ray a solution that we provide for critical care as well as the point of care applications. And this is uh, T7S. So A stands for anesthesia, critical care, and emergency. It's uh, basically a tablet-based system which can help you in any critical scenario and support you with an excellent diagnosis. We have an advanced application for lung ultrasound, and that is smart B line. As you can see in this image, machine will automatically detect the B lines in your image. So it will give you the number score as well as the distance of B lines and give you a complete analysis of lung water evaluation. As well as what's unique in Mindre is the color coding chart, which can give you the detailed situation of lung and the advancement of the disease. Uh, now I would like to just run a small video for P7 unit. Volume is not there. Shivangi, no sound. Share. When you select at the bottom, select sound when you are sharing the screen. Shivangi, can you stop share and share again? And at the bottom, you will get select sound. We cannot, we cannot hear the sound. Shivangi, you'll have to stop share. Okay, okay. just a minute. I'll stop share and I'll share that again. Just a minute.
Thank you all. Should I start? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Richa, share your screen and you can start. Okay. I would like to thank Kerala IRIA for the kind invitation. Um, I'll begin today's talk. One second. So today I'm going to talk on a very broad topic on um, what role MRI plays, uh, cardiac MRI plays, you know, in day-to-day -day practice, how it can be helpful, what are its pros, what are its cons. The talk is going to be very comprehensive and uh, at a very basic level. Any questions, please feel free to ask at the end of the session. So today, in today's talk, I'll be covering basically some practical, practical points before we start doing cardiac MRI. What are the sequences in cardiac MRI and how are they different from our regular MRI sequences? What are its capabilities? What is it capable of doing? And how do we use those capabilities in day-to-day -day life and some of its special applications, okay? So first, 1.5 or 3 Tesla, does it matter? Uh, cardiac MRI can be done in both, uh, 1.5 as well as 3 Tesla. 3 Tesla will have better resolution, but at the same time, it will have more artifacts. So we kind of need to uh, tailor our protocol in such a way that we get good images. Renal function, it's like any other gadolinium-based uh, MRI study. Uh, we don't do below 30 EGFR. Uh, 30 to 45 EGFR, we usually refer to a nephrologist and based on the patient's clinical condition, they'll decide whether they want to go ahead with a gadolinium-based study or no. Above 45 EGFR, there's usually no issues in doing uh, gadolinium-based MRI. Between 30 to 45 EGFR, sometimes we, we may use cyclic gadolinium compounds rather than linear. Cardiac MRI is an ECG-gated study. We def Each and every sequence is ECG-gated. Uh, and respiration gated, uh, patients need to hold their breath for say around somewhere between six to 12 seconds for each um, cycle. There are newer ways of doing it uh, without breath hold with free breathing. And we have started using it more and more, especially in children. So let's come to basic sequences. Uh, in cardiac MRI, we don't do so much, you know, T1 or T2 sequences like we do for all our other um, body organs. Uh, here, we, our basic sequences, we kind of call them black blood and white blood images. So black blood means, as the name suggests, the blood will appear black compared to the myocardium. These are usually just static images. These are spin echo images. They're not basically just T1 or T2. They are uh, not more heavily T1 or T2 weighted, they are spin echo. And we usually use them for anatomical assessment. White blood images, blood appears bright. They may be static or cine. These are gradient echo images and different companies have different names, BTFE, Fiesta, like that. And we use them for anatomical as well as functional assessment. So these are black blood images. Um, which we usually, this is usually the first sequence we acquire while doing cardiac MR for an overall overview of the chest, mediastinum, and the heart. Followed by that, we'll go ahead with our MRI sequences, which are usually white blood images. Uh, they may be static or cine, and they do not follow our orthogonal planes of axial, sagittal, or coronal. We will take it in specific cardiac imaging planes. Uh, like see, this is called the four chamber view where we see all four chambers of the heart. This is the two chamber view where we see the LA and LV. This is the short axis view, which kind of gives us a cut across cross sectional view of the, this is the left atrium and the left ventricle. We use these for functional and anatomical assessment. The, the, uh, when we give contrast, we may do perfusion. Where perfusion sequences are usually um, 
either gradient or gradient EPI hybrid sequences. They are very fast because we want to do, uh, we want one heartbeat in every second of the entire heart. So we usually take three slices. So we need to take three slices in every heartbeat. So they need to be really fast. You can see how fast the video is running. So these are basically a lot of sequences in a cine loop. Uh, we usually use them in short axis and the most common use we use them is for stress perfusion when we are doing um, looking for ischemia. Delayed enhancement is the most important or the gold standard sequence of cardiac MRI. It's a triple inversion recovery sequence. What happens is followed by a 180 degree preparatory pulse. Then um, there is, there's triple inversion and we... Um, acquire the images to get delayed enhancement. So if we talk about gadolinium kinetics, what happens is normal gad gadolinium is an extracellular agent. Okay? So it cannot um, enter inside the cells unless there is rupture of the cell membrane. So like we see in this case, an acute MI, uh, because of rupture of the cell membranes, the gadolinium enters the cell, uh, within the cell. So there's intra and extracellular gadolinium. Uh, but in chronic M MI or scars, because of collagenous scar and shrinkage or absence of the viable myocytes, the gadolinium accumulates in the fibro uh, fibrous tissue and we see enhancement. So when we give gadolinium, if we map, uh, if we make a graph of gadolinium enhancement across time, what happens is first thing to enhance will obviously be the blood pool. Then the normal myocardium also enhances in the early stages and ischemic myocardium. But however, over time passes, blood uh, within uh, after five minutes, the gadolinium um, will not be seen as much in the blood and normal myocardium, but it starts accumulating in the extracellular tissues, so in fibrous scars. So in infarction or any other scars, we start seeing gadolinium accumulating. So this is why we do delayed enhancement uh, to get the optimum uh, images with scar tissue. So suppose if we take enhancement images at one to three images, uh, one to three minutes, what we will see will not be infarcted tissue. But if we take later on, we are more likely to see infarcted tissue. So this is the, uh, again, the map of uh, inversion time with uh, magnitude. And we can see how uh, compared to myocardium, the infarcted tissue shows more. So that's where we come to look locker, where we take uh, TI scouts at multiple different times. And this is the sequence where we decide which is the optimal TI time to do our delayed enhancement sequences. So once we give contrast after say five to seven minutes, uh, we will take a something called this look locker or a TI scout where we open uh, in the mid-ventricular slices, we get multiple slices with different TI times. And the slice where we see the myocardium, normal myocardium as black without any artifacts is the best TI time to choose. So in this case, we would choose this. And in uh, delayed enhancement images, the technician will enter TI time specifically as say 312 or 320 milliseconds. And the subsequent delayed enhancement images will be obtained at that TI time. So we get images of this quality. To show you an example, we've put the correct TI time and these are the delayed enhancement images we've got. So what happened is, because we've taken them after um, five to six minutes, uh, the contrast has accumulated maximum in the scar tissue. And we have chosen a perfect TI time where the normal myocardium is nulled, that is, it is black. So in these images, we can see that the normal myocardium appears black. And here we can see the scar tissue appears white. So the contrast between the scar tissue and the normal myocardium helps us determine that there is late gadolinium enhancement. And this is the gold standard sequence where different patterns help us determine what's the underlying pathology. So this is what I was talking about, uh, which we'll again come to in the later part of the lecture. But um, this is one diagram which PGs need to remember um, because uh, in addition to functional imaging, this is what does morphological assessment in cardiac MR. So based on how the scar is placed, I will determine what is the type of cardiomyopathy. 
Uh, I've just shown this here for reference, but I'll describe each and every cardiomyopathy as we come to it. Another sequence we use in cardiac MRI is something called face contrast imaging, which we even use in others like neuro and all. So it not only gives us flow direction, but it also quantifies it. We get velocity and we also get the gradient. So how it works is we take a cross section across the vessel and it can give us quantitative values of the flow that say 50 ml of flow is passing of which 40 is forward and 10 is backward. So we get not only the magnitude, but also the direction at wherever we take the uh, phase contrast slice. So suppose this is an example where I have taken a phase contrast across the ascending aorta, which tells me that the total flow is around 34, uh, 37, sorry, of which forward 37.1, of which forward is 37.3 and uh, regurgitation is just 0 0.2. So we can even calculate the regurgitation fraction. So this is a normal one, but in case of abnormalities, we can calculate the regurgitation fraction and the regurgitation volume in case of regurgitation. So let's come to MRI. Uh, what are its capabilities? Uh, it not only helps us in anatomy, but also function. Morphological assessment and the uh, overall advantage is there's no radiation compared to CT or nuclear studies. Okay, so this is a standard uh, straightforward black blood uh, image which of the entire chest, which we've taken. So this is very helpful for the anatomy, as you can see, with the advantage of no radiation, no contrast, it really helps us to determine the anatomy. So if we see here, this is the RA, RV, LV, LA, this is the aorta coming off, and this you can see is the RSVC and this dual SVC in this case. Uh, similarly, this is another example where we can very clearly determine the uh, anatomy. So here we can see this is the cross sections the view across the aortic valve. So we can see so clearly that it's a bicuspid aortic valve with no significant stenosis. It's really opening well. And this is a black blood image where we can see the coarctation. This is another example of a coarctation, but this is an example of an MR angiography where we have given contrast and we can see that it's a resolution and depiction is really well. So moving on from anatomy, when we come to function, sorry. So as of now, cardiac MR is the gold standard for left ventricular as well as right ventricular function. Um, so usually to calculate function, we obtain a stack of images from base of the lung to the apex, like I've shown here. So I'm from base of the lung to the apex, and we uh, use software to calculate the LV and the RV volumes. So we can see we can see the entire LV and the RV contracting well, and we can use that to calculate the volumes. So not only for functional assessment, it um, when would we need functional assessment? We would need it especially in cases of heart failure. Um, sometimes some drugs are given, not like, for example, um, post-heart failure therapy, some medication, medical management, and we want to see follow-up whether the patient has improved or not. Not just that, post-chemotherapeutic drugs, uh, whether they have affected, um, whether they're causing any cardiomyopathy or cardiotoxicity, uh, this helps in that, and also in pre- and post-transplant assessment. Another way which this helps is in valvular assessment, which I'll just show you in the following case. So suppose this is a case where I have taken, this is something called a three-chamber view where you can see the left atrium, left ventricle, and the aorta, and this is the aortic valve. We can very clearly see that the aortic valve leaflets are thickened. Also, they are not opening well. They are hardly opening. So there's aortic valve thickening with stenosis, and this is what is called as flow acceleration. So it's like a artifact which we use to diagnose stenosis. Like in Doppler, we use aliasing to diagnose stenosis. Similarly, in MRI, we would use this is some flow acceleration to diagnose stenosis. Similarly, this we've just cut across here. So this is a cine aortic valve view where you can see it's a functionally bicuspid valve with a raffe here, the thickened leaflets and see, you can just make out that the um, it's hardly opening. So there's a lot of stenosis. The valve leaflets are not completely opening. 
So to quantitate stenosis, we can use these uh, phase contrast studies and get velocity quantitatively, and we can calculate the aortic valve area on this view. Suppose this, I would just draw the ROI here and I would get the aortic valve area. So both these features help to uh, quantitate the stenosis. These are some other examples of uh, valvular heart disease. So suppose if we start with this, uh, we can see biatrial biventricular dilatation. This is the tricuspid and the mitral valve. We can see there's a lot of regurgitation here. This is the flow jet, which we can see. And there is more mitral regurgitation compared to tricuspid, right? If you come to this case, the left atrium and left ventricle are dilated. This is the mitral valve. If we see carefully, it's not, it's not opening completely also. And there is some regurgitation also. So this is a mixed mitral valve disease with stenosis as well as regurgitation. This is another case. So this is the three-chamber view. This is the aortic valve, mildly thickened leaflets. Again, we are seeing regurgitation. And there is flow acceleration with the valve not opening uh, completely. So this is again a mixed aortic valve disease with stenosis and regurgitation. Um, similarly, we can quantitate regurgitation also by like I showed in the in earlier slides by giving the regurgitation fraction and volume. Not just that, uh, sometimes uh, surgeons don't want to do a complete um, replacement and they just want to go ahead with a repair. So we can, um, like how, suppose this is the mitral valve, it has three components, A1, A2, P, A3, P1, P2, P3. So detailed views across A1, P1, A2, P2, A3, P3, we can do, and we can tell specifically which one is abnormal. And in case it's a younger patient and they don't want to replace uh, as of now, they can uh, go ahead and just do the uh, A1, P1 or A2, P2 repair. Let's come to morphology. The most important use of morphology is for cardiomyopathy diagnosis. But if we don't just stop at diagnosis, we can also prognosticate the disease, help for risk stratification and family screening in genetic diseases. Another use is heart failure to determine what's its cause and then also for subsequent follow-ups. Myopericarditis is another way uh, used for morphology. So let's see now few cases of cardiomyopathies. Um, so echo, if we do, uh, we usually get an indication saying LV hypertrophy with reduced function or normal function on echocardiography, but it's not always possible for echocardiography to tell us the cause of LV hypertrophy. So this is a slide I borrowed from my boss. So here we can see each and every case has some element of LV hypertrophy. You can see here there's hypertrophy, there's hypertrophy, but if what is the cause of LV hypertrophy? So when we do late gadolinium enhancement, the different patterns of enhancement help us to determine, oh, this is LV cardiomyopathy, but it's because of hypertension or it's because of HCM or it's because of amyloid or so on and so forth. Let's see the few of those cases. This is again uh, the, what I was talking about, patterns of late gadolinium enhancement uh, which is a question asked in theory. So basically you have to know all the patterns. So suppose if I start with this one, it's um, near transmural enhancement following a vascular territory of LAD. Uh, so this is actually an acute myocardial infarction with microvascular obstruction within. This is patchy, uh, first of all, there's LV hypertrophy with patchy mid myocardial fibrosis. This is actually a case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is dilated left ventricle with very thin mid myocardial linear enhancement, which is DCM. This is smooth, diffused, linear subendocardial enhancement, which is amyloid. And this is a patchy, patchy mid epicardial enhancement, which goes in favor of myocarditis. In this case, it was a sarcoid. So let's see the first case. So uh, we'll begin with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's a genetic disease. Uh, it's seen... Um, as the name suggests, there's LV hypertrophy. Um, there's a lot of the definition is more than 15 millimeter in the absence of loading conditions like hypertension or aortic stenosis. Um, so like we can see here, this is the four chamber view. We can see that the LV is hypertrophied. Here also we can see LV is hypertrophy. There's an associated feature here where we can see if this is the mitral valve. If we see in systole, it's going anteriorly. So this is called systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve leaflet. And we can see associated flow acceleration. This is a feature of 
hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The um, enhancement pattern is patchy mid-myocardial, usually in the hypertrophy segments. So this was a case of actually uh, hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy with very severe fibrotic burden of around 40% and all. So, but I'll show you another case which has less fibrosis, which is more typical and more often seen. As you can see, there's LV hypertrophy here, and this is patchy mid-myocardial enhancement. Uh, let's come to amyloidosis. There is um, some mild biventricular dilatation, sorry, bi biventricular dilatation with biatrial dilatation. There's some valve regurgitation and mild pericardial effusion. Um, on delayed enhancement, what we saw was a mild, smooth, diffuse subendocardial enhancement. These are T1 mapping images, pre-contrast and post-contrast. They are especially helpful amyloid. Uh, so to explain about T1 mapping, um, if in short, if I just say like, you know, every tissue has its T1 values, whether it's liver, brain, or heart. So even myocardium has its normal native T1 values. Um, numerical assessment or objective assessment of that pixel base is T1 mapping. So we basically acquire slices and uh, the software gives us a pixel based numerical value. And that gives us the T1 value at that pixel. Uh, we have to calculate the T1 native values for each and every machine. So for our center, it is 1250 milliseconds is the normal T1 native value. T1 native value usually reduces with fat and iron, and it increases with edema, inflammation, infiltration. Um, so usually in our center, we've seen any abnormalities will be say 1300 to 1350, 1400. And amyloid, uh, actually has very high T1 native values. So amyloid will be 1500, 1600. So sometimes amyloid patients with renal involvement and we cannot give gadolinium, we even do plain contrast studies and plain studies without contrast and just do T1 mapping. And if it's in 1500, 1600 range, it's more in favor of amyloid. So this was a very high T1 native value with a very raised ECV value also. Coming to sarcoid, this was another case of sarcoidosis where we can see there's left atrial and left ventricular dilatation. You can see it's not moving very well also. There's some hypokinesia and there's some intraventricular dysentery. This move is moving before, this is moving later. And when we do post-contrast enhancement, it's very patchy-patchy. There's some mid-myocardial enhancement here. There's mid-myocardial plus nearly near transmural. There's some epicardial enhancement here. So these are features of myocarditis. In our country, especially sarcoid and tuberculosis appear this way. Coming to dilated cardiomyopathy, as the name suggests, it's uni or biventricular dilatation with dysfunction. So as we can see here, the left ventricle is hardly moving well. So there's definitely dysfunction and it's also, it's also dilated. So this is a case of DCM. But there's not much uh, post-contrast enhancement. To, in contrast, this is another case of DCM where we can see that the left ventricle again is not moving as well and it's dilated. But in this case, what we are seeing is a typical linear mid-myocardial enhancement. And similarly on T1 native also, it's increased and ECV post-contrast uh, post T1 also, we can see that that uh, value is increased. So what this means is um, DCM as such is a very broad criteria. When we label a patient DCM, it's just based on function and um, dilatation. Dilated ventricle with less function, DCM. But then there are multiple causes for DCM. Patient could be ischemic with severe you know, coronary artery disease with infarction. And so it could be an ischemic DCM or it could be a non-ischemic DCM like these two cases I have shown you. So in the first case, we saw no enhancement. And in this case, we are seeing this typical mid-myocardial enhancement. What's the significance? The significance is that patients with LGE, with delayed uh, gadolinium enhancement, have a worse prognosis compared to patients with no enhancement. That is one. These patients may need... Um, uh, this ICD or those pacemaker devices later on if they have arrhythmia. 
Another one implication is uh, patients with mid myocardial enhancement, the cause is thought to be that maybe they are post myocarditis. That's a hypothesis, don't know for sure. So when we label a patient DCM, we're basically looking at the cause of DCM. So it might be ischemic or it might be non-ischemic, in which case we might sometimes be able to say myocarditis, worse myocarditis, or sometimes we may not be able to tell the cause. But basically, these patterns of enhancement help us to determine the cause. If it's a patchy, patchy myocarditis kind of enhancement, you may say maybe because of myocarditis. If it's, um, you know, that amyloid kind of enhancement, you can say DCM maybe due to amyloid, like that. Uh, this is another genetic case. Uh, ARVC is arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. It's a genetic cause. It's another cause of sudden cardiac death in young adults. So as the name suggests, it's a right ventricular cardiomyopathy. So if you carefully, you will see these small, small outpouchings along the right ventricular free wall, which are not normally seen. So the feature of ARVC is dilated RV. There are these, uh, there are criteria, something called modified task force criteria, which we follow to diagnose ARVC. So dilated RV following that criteria with aneurysmal outpouchings or dyskinesis along the RV wall is one major criteria for ARVC. But MR by itself cannot just diagnose it. It can pinpoint to it and raise a suspicion and then uh, we need to do family history and ECG and all. Uh, these are delayed enhancement images. We see if you can make out, this is RV wall enhancement. So now what is this? What is this doing? So we are also seeing LV enhancement, right? So this was actually a case of ARVC with left ventricular in, uh, involvement or ARVC with ALVC. Um, let's come to the next case. Iron overload, this is actually a young girl with repeated heart failure and people couldn't, the uh, clinicians couldn't figure out what's happening, uh, came to us for MRI. This is delayed enhancement images. This is post-native T1 and these are actually T2 star serial images. If you see, as the uh, this thing, mid time is increasing, it, um, the myocardium is becoming more and more um, black. So that is typical of iron overload like we see in thalassemia uh, patients, right? When we do those uh, MRI studies. Also, we see this is native T1, the T1 is very reduced. So this was actually a case of iron overload. Uh, we screened her brother and he also had a similar findings, though asymptomatic. This is another uh, uh, Example of a cardiomyopathy by cardiac MRI, we can see both the ventricles are small in size, not expanding well. So this is something we call restrictive cardiomyopathy. As the name suggests, the ventricles don't expand too much, right? And there's biventricular dilatation with uh, mitral and tricuspid regurgitation. There is mild pericardial and mild left pleural effusion. On post-contrast images, we can see there's this subendocardial enhancement with, oh, sorry, uh, with hypointensity, right? Non-enhancing area. So this is a typical endomyocardial fibrosis. And when we did CT, this was actually some calcification. Uh, so this is how it looks restrictive uh, on cine images and on post gadolinium enhancement, you'll have subendocardial enhancement with uh, further internal hypointensities, non-enhancing areas. Let's come to one of the major indications for cardiac MRI. Why do clinicians send us patients for cardiac MR? They basically have these questions in mind. What they want to know is, is there coronary artery disease? If they already know there's coronary artery disease, what they want to know from us is, is it functionally significant? If so, in which territory? Is the territory still viable? And sometimes they may suspect ischemic heart disease, but on MRI, we are saying, no, it's not ischemic heart disease. Then MR is the only modality which will tell them what it is. Because all those different patterns of enhancement of cardiomyopathy, which we saw so far, MR is the best modality to diagnose it. So let's start with an uh, example of ischemia imaging. So this is a patient uh, with double vessel disease. Uh, who came to us for ischemia. So these are 
uh, stress perfusion images, which we've taken after giving gadolinium to the patient. So if you can make out uh, the contrast is first entering the left vent, right ventricle, left ventricle, then it starts to enhance the walls, but some walls don't perfuse, they remain black. So if I come to the representative static images, this is nice perfusion of the myocardium, but this part of the myocardium is not perfusing with contrast. So there's a perfusion defect, right? Um, at the same time, when we did lead gadolinium enhancement in these patients, there was no enhancement. So what we're trying to say here is that this is the area which there's no infarct as of now, but there is ischemia. So to kind of summarize, uh, if stress perfusion shows a defect, but stress perfusion doesn't show a defect and there's no enhancement, it's ischemia. Uh, let's come to our next case. Uh, here, uh, what we are seeing up is the cine images at basal, mid, and apical levels. These are the same corresponding late gadolinium enhancement images. So if we see... Um, in this, we can see that certain areas like this anterior and anteroceptal areas are not moving well compared to the lateral and the inferior wall in the mid, as well as in the apical. You can see the septum is hardly moving compared to the other segments. Even though everything is moving a little bit less, but some areas are moving even less than the others. So this is called hypokinesis. Correspondingly, if we see, we're seeing some neurotransmural enhancement in those same areas which are not moving well. So these are neurotransmural enhancement. This is the LED territory. And what are we seeing here is actually a uh, LV clot. That corresponding area also showed edema on stir. So this was basically a case of acute myocardial infarction in the LED territory with LV clot. Uh, these are uh, two chamber and four chamber cine and late gadolinium enhancement images of the same patient where we can see the clot very nicely here in the LV apex. And we can also see that corresponding areas are not moving well and show neurotransmural enhancement. Let's come to another case. Again, basal, mid, apical, cine and late gadolinium enhancement images. Here we can see that, yes, they are moving less. Uh, again, the same areas, mid anteroceptal anterior and apical septal and anterior areas. But here, what we are seeing is that there's enhancement, but it's not involving the entire thickness of the myocardium. It's not transmural, it's subendocardial. So uh, the reason for showing you both these cases is uh, that we need these sequences to determine viability. So how do we determine viability? In late gadolinium enhancement, if it's subendocardial to intermediate, but it's moving slowly, it's hypokinetic, then we call it viable. If it's neurotransmural enhancement with no movement at all, or moving in the opposite direction when it should come in, it's pushing out, then we call it non viable. So let's just go back to this case. See, this is subendocardial to intermediate enhancement with hypokinesis, so I would call it viable infarction in the LED territory. And if we go back to the previous case, uh, you can see these are neurotransmural infarctions with kinesis. so this is non-viable infarction in the LED territory. Why does it matter whether it's viable or non-viable? Based on viability, uh, the surgeon or the clinician takes the further decision. Patient has acute MI uh, or MI and the territory is already non-viable. There is no point in going ahead and revascularizing the patient. That myocardium is already dead. But if the myocardium is still viable, revascularization should be done the stent in the form of either stents or bypass grafts, which will help the patient to improve the function later on. Another way of determining viability is by giving low-dose dobutamine. So um, this is rest images of the short axis, where we can see that, again, the left, um, uh, sorry, uh, anteroceptal anterior area is moving less compared to rest of the other areas. Here we have given uh, dobutamine and its function has improved. So improvement in function after low-dose dobutamine 
is a feature of uh, viable myocardium. Now let's see how cardiac MR compares to other modalities. Because MRI is a relatively um, newer entrant in this game compared to SPECT and echocardiography. So this is a really good study published in Lancet, very old, 2003, which compares cardiac MR with SPECT and histology. So we, the gray is the cardiac MR, black is histology, and the white is SPECT. So we can see that in sub, so this is percentage of infarction, so sub and according to thick, myocardial thickness. So we can see, suppose in subendocardial infarction, MRI is as good as histopathology, but SPECT is not as not at good at all. Uh, however, as we move towards transmurality, even SPECT starts picking up uh, infarction like MRI. So to, for a pictorial representation, this is the subendocardial infarction and histopathology image of that, but SPECT doesn't pick it up, MRI picks it up. This is another study where MRI is compared to PET. Uh, the gray is MRI and black is PET. So um, even in low EF, uh, patients with uh, LV dysfunction, MRI is better than PET at picking up inf uh, infarction. This is a MR impact 2 study where they compared MRI with SPECT. And so the continuous line is MRI in all the images and the discontinuous or the dotted line represents SPECT. In the end, this is about entire study population, multi-vessel disease, male or females. And in each and every scenario, MRI was better than SPECT at sensitivity. This is the other CMARC trial where the blue line is MRI and the pink line is SPECT. And again, we can see that MRI has better sensitivity compared to SPECT. So these are some of the common scenarios or more likely indications which come to us. Uh, viability or ischemic heart disease disease assessment, patient has new heart failure, what's the cause? Is it ischemic? Is it non-ischemic? If it's non-ischemic, what's the cardiomyopathy? Um, another common indication is hypertension and that what we do is we not only cover the heart, uh, we also look for young hypertensives is what I mean. So what we do is we cover the adrenals, we cover the renal arteries. So we give them an uh, uh, basically, we rule out adrenal disease, renal artery stenosis, and also coarctation or some such secondary causes of hypertension in uh, young patients. Let's come to some special or unusual scenarios. This was a patient. These are late gadolinium enhancement images. If you can see this, this diffuse, very intense pericardial enhancement. And this is corresponding images on STIR. The same patient, these are cine images. If you can see um, that the ventricle cannot really expand too much because the pericardium is restricting it. So there is restricted free wall movement of the ventricles. There's diffuse pericardial thickening and enhancement as, and edema as we can see here. And there's bilateral moderate pleural effusions. This was a case of acute constrictive pericarditis. This was another patient uh, with sudden LV. Uh, this was actually a 50-year-old female with sudden onset of left ventricular failure. Uh, we did MRI. So this is typical appearance of Takotsubo cardiomyopathy where there's ballooning of the LV apex. Uh, on follow-up of the patient, this patient recovered within three months. This is a young child who came to us uh, with mass seen in right atrium on echocardiography. So we did the MRI, uh, sorry. And uh, these are the cine images where you can see that there's a mass in the right atrium with broad base up along the free wall. There's also pericardial effusion and bilateral pleural effusion. The mass is slightly prolapsing into the tricuspid valve. Uh, sorry, this is not well visible, but these are first pass perfusion images of that same mass. So you can see some mild homogeneous enhancement. This is post contrast T1 enhancement. Uh, we can see homogeneous mild enhancement in the mass. 
then these are late, uh, sorry, thrive images where again we can see some enhancement. Uh, we called it lymphoma suspicion and patient underwent surgery and it came as a B cell lymphoma histopathology. So to discuss and briefly about masses because that might be asked in the exam, what we do in mass assessment is kind of mass assessment like anywhere else in the body. We Mass is the only time we do actual T1, T2. Uh, perfusion and post contrast images and uh, more images we may take based on the location of the mass. Once we do that, how we analyze mass and cardiac MR is multiple things. First, we see the age of the patient. Okay. Second, we see which chamber is involved. And third, we see the morphological characteristics. We put all these three together and say that so uh, X or Y is the possible differential diagnosis. So this is kind of, I've just made a table there's uh, upper other uh, common benign and then common malignant masses. So um, once, uh, like I just said, age, chamber involvement and morphological characteristics, these are the three main features we use to diagnose masses. In morphological characteristics, again, like any other masses, benign and malignant have the same things. Benign will be more well-defined more homogeneous enhancement or non-enhancing, malignant, infiltrative, very speculated, um, with heterogeneous enhancement goes in favor of malignant. So that feature remains the same. How cardiac MR differs is, suppose we talk about myxoma. So that's the commonest cardiac mass. Again, um, it will be mobile, it will have a uh, be pedunculated, it will mostly be in, attached to the interatrial septum and the most common location is left atria. Uh, on it will show um, in hyper intensity on STAR and it may show heterogeneous contrast enhancement. So a mass which is mobile, pedunculated in the left atrium attached to the interventricular septum in the um, with edema on STAR and delayed enhancement, uh, it would probably be a myxoma. So similarly, so on and so forth, rhabdomyoma and uh, fibroma are seen in children. They are mostly in the ventricles and tramyocardial. How we differentiate between them uh, would be based on uh, T2 and delayed contrast enhancement and other features. Let's come to a very special scenario. We often get requisitions for cardiac MR for constrictive versus restrictive cardiomyopathy. So this is kind of showing you both at a glance. So if let's start with the case on the right, we can see bilateral pleural effusion. We can see that both the ventricles are not expanding out. There's something which is restricting the lateral wall movement of the ventricles. And if you see carefully at the septum, it's kind of bouncing back and forth between both the ventricles. So this is called a septal bounce with restriction of uh, free valve movement. So this was a case of constrictive pericarditis. But if you look here, Again, the ventricles are not really expanding so much, but that is not a feature of something external restricting the ventricles. That's by a myocardial feature where the ventricles are not expanding much. And we can see uh, AO, uh, AV valve regurgitation with biatrial dilatation. So this is a case of restrictive cardiomyopathy. This is a CT of this patient. Uh, where we can see there's actually dense calcium uh, along the pericardium. This is another case. Uh, so what happens with valves? Can we still scan the patient when after they have undergone valve replacement? So this is to show you that this was post AVR and we can see that we can see the valve so well. This was, uh, sometimes you may have some artifacts, you may have to scan in 1.5 Tesla instead of three Tesla, but usually you should be able to scan the valve and give an answer. So coming to the conclusion of our talk, um, advantages, it has really good temporal spatial resolution, no radiation. It not only helps with function, but also morphology and helps to determine the cause. We can quantify uh, the various, like suppose valvular heart disease, we can quantify the aortic steno the stenosis and the regurgitation. And we don't have any issues like acoustic windows like in echocardiography. The downside is its availability of the technology and the expertise to report. Cost might be a factor compared to echocardiography. It's a relatively newer modality compared to echo and nu uh, nuclear medicine. So for clinicians to accept it, uh, though that's 
not so much of an issue now. Um, as of now, we faced only one absolute contraindication to cardiac MR, and that is claustrophobia. If a patient is scared, there's nothing we can do about it. Newer pacemakers are invariably MR compatible. Very old pacemakers might be non-compatible. So it's actually a comprehensive one-stop test to help us diagnose. The most common indication one would be likely to face would be cardiomyopathy. Uh, sorry, viability. Cardiomyopathy, not on, it not only helps in diagnosis, prognosis, but also follow-up. Uh, it would be, we should start making it a part of our daily practice to get more and more used to it. Thank you. Any questions? I would be happy to take. Uh, yeah, Richa, I have one question for you. Yeah, please. So when we do the viability study, because I usually report this by cardiac viability more i get more cases here so i just want to know uh, we have the subundocardial infarction intramural infarction whole thickness infarction so do you give the percentage of involvement in the report so uh, clinicians are not really interested in percentage so uh -huh. uh, subendocardial less than 25 percent and if it's hypokinetic we give it viable Near transmural with a kinesis, we give it non viable. There are some gray areas where you know it might be between 50 and 75. You really don't know whether to call it viable or non viable. Then we look at wall motion and decide. Uh, what we give numerical value is number of segments. Yeah, that uh, we like, give usually. Yeah, but other than that, uh, we actually in our report we have a pictorial. Um, yeah. It comes in the computer itself. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. The chart comes very, in the computer. Yeah, so that subendocardial, they understand. So that percentage we don't give, we just give number of uh, uh, segments involvement, like six are non viable or four are non viable. Non viable, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was a question. Then I, the last time I asked you about the perfusion study, which you don't do for viability. Uh, perfusion then, for viability or uh, dobutamine, we do, but less. Uh, but usually we end up telling viability just based on cine and gadolinium, or late gadolinium enhancement. Sometimes patients, we can't give contrast. We end up doing dobutamine for uh, viability. We, that is just low dose, up to 20 microgram. And if the function improves and that area, regional wall motion abnormality improves, we say it's viable. Okay. It's very good. Very good. Okay. Uh, do you okay. do uh, this uh, uh, dynamic study for this uh, uh, cardiac imaging? So dynamic uh, study, we do an all stress MRIs yeah. where we yeah. give adenosine and contrast at the same time and get those perfusion images like I showed in that case. Another place where we do perfusion is muscles. Okay. Yeah. We don't I, rest yeah. Done in all the cases, but we don't sit in ambulance. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Richa, for your wonderful session. Thank you session. so much, Richa. <laughs> I, uh, I have a asked. few questions. Uh, no, actually, ma'am, that's not a question. I think uh, that's an appreciation that, you know, somebody has asked if you could provide them with the PPT that PPT, you made. Right yeah, 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 I just saw it. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, appreciation uh, for your yeah, talk. Yeah. So, uh, actually, Dr. Richa, I have a, I'm sorry, I'm having a very unstable network, so I'm not sure if you've spoken this and I've missed it out. No issues. Uh, we are talking about viability. So, um, what is a normal norm is the patient comes in, goes, undergoes an angiogram, goes in for an angioplasty on table. So, when is it that you would suggest that this patient undergo a viability scan, which in the present scenario doesn't fit into the normal practice? So, according to your experience, where would you think it would fit in? So usually what happens uh, is patient comes to the clinician, they do a cath angio, and they usually directly go ahead with revascularization, whether the territory is viable or not. That's usually what happens in most of the places. Um, in some cases, there'll be a break after the CAT study and the patient will be sent for a viability study, which might be nuclear, it might be echo, it might be MR. So it is totally at the clinician discretion whether they send the patient for viability or they go ahead with revascularization. So at our place, what happens is because it's a tertiary or quaternary center and we get a lot of referral patients who are already undergone, like you said, cath angio and everything. Um, what we get referred for these viability studies, especially 
uh, these very young patients, like nowadays in India, we see coronary artery disease in patients in 30s and 40s. So um, our clinicians would like to avoid bypass or something at such a young age, because say the life of the bypass is 20 years. What do we do 20 years down the line? You have to again do a re redo surgery. So in our uh, uh, institute, one of the main reasons is these young patients with severe coronary artery disease, and let's just see what it is. And let's uh, decide whether you know they can be treated by a stent or by a medical management, and we can avoid CABG at a young age or not. Or if it's already non-viable, then there's no point in doing a CABG that way. Yeah, so actually, uh, we are, I wanted to request our IRA also because we have been seeing young deaths now. Recently, this month, we have seen young deaths that to doctors yeah, dying at a younger age. We feel very sorry, between 35 to 40. One has died at the age of 23. Mm -hmm. I feel so bad. So I feel that a master health checkup, including cardiac MRI, should be there because that will help you to quantify the myocardium. It will help us to tell the myocardium healthy or unhealthy. I feel that that should be uh, done throughout India. We have started getting a lot of coronary angios since these famous yeah, young yeah. deaths. We've seen an uh, increase in uh, coronary angios. And then um, based on that, if there's intermediate disease or something, then they go ahead for a stress MR. Yeah. I think that will come up as the awareness of it keeps coming up. Yeah, so as more and more up. people practice cardiac MR, more and more clinicians will refer. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's all. <laughs> please, please practice cardiac yeah. MR. There's a lot of tutorials <laughs> and uh, this I know you're motivating a lot of us by doing, you know, by your talks. So hopefully, yes, many of the audience also <laughs> yeah. would probably opt for it. I have uh, one or two more questions for you. Um, very limited ex uh, experience with cardiac MR, actually. But when you said that we have this gated MRS, so when you end up getting a patient who has a tachycardia, so your entire plan changes, then you have to get the heart rate stabilized and all that. So no, no, you don't. Okay, that's what we So uh, that way CT and MR are different in arrhythmia. Our issues is tachy. We want the heart rate low and regular. In MRI, tachy is not a problem. Brady is a problem. So if yeah. it's tachy and regular, no issues uh, at all. Only issues we would face is irregular, number one, or two, bradyarrhythmias in MRI. It's it's kind of ultra because of the way the machine scans. Um, every RR interval is when it determines the scan. So the more the gap between the RR interval, the more the patient has to hold the breath. So uh, th that's why brady is a problem, but not tacky. Uh, there are ways to, multiple technical ways to solve this issue. Oh. That in itself is a physics it's class. Yeah, yeah. it's already it is already yeah. documented in our machines. And yeah. uh, so it shows, uh, it you... shows the ECGs. It shows everything. And we have this uh, MR compatible ECG leads also, which yeah. directly shows the heart rate, the pulse rate. Helps in the uh, yeah. we can, so we can just... do you recommend any preparations for them, or do they just no? They are walking we, patients. We play around bradycardia and arrhythmia patients. We play around with our technical parameters on the spot until now we've not refused a patient for arrhythmia we've managed to scan it so there are multiple things you can do you can reduce the effect to just label a few you can reduce the phases you can reduce the phase percentage you can uh, reduce the you can play around with the fov or you can play around with something called parallel imaging p reduction you can a lot of technical things you can do uh, you can do free breathing so it depends on the particular scenario we make some changes yeah. Okay. Great, great, great. So, uh, yeah, that was something that is, uh, I was just asking out of curiosity. So, uh, thank you. That was great. I don't see any more questions in the section per se. So, uh, ma'am, I'll proceed with the yeah. vote of thanks. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. First, it's our Dr. Thank Richard you Othari. to Kerala IRIA for the invitation. <laughs> thanks. Thank you. It was a very amazing and informative session because you, you know, you practically touched base with the technique, anatomy, pathologies, everything was covered in, in a complete, you know, you put it in a capsule manner. It was amazing. And I know the way you have managed to squeeze this talk amongst your work. Again, you're in the middle of your work, yet you have managed to squeeze that talk in there. So thank you so much for that. And uh, thank you, uh, Gomiti Subramaniam, ma'am.
President Kerala IRIA, who is a passionate academician, who is pushing and driving us with her passion. She's pushing all of us into the academics, and she is very particular about all this happening regionally. Further, I would like to thank Dr. Venugopal, sir. He's our academics chairman and the one who guides us through all the academic session planning. Thank you, sir. I would like to thank Dr. Ramesh Srinoy, sir, who is our program coordinator, who is instrumental from the program planning to execution, yet always stays the hidden man behind curtains. Thank you so much, sir. Next, uh, though Dr. Rajo, sir, is not here. He is uh, not on the dais with us, but I'm thankful, I'm thankful to sir, because he's always encouraging and uh, inspiring us. Further, I'd like to thank our entire panel of academic coordinators who work hard to ensure that the academics run smoothly and seamlessly. I thank the entire MindRay team for providing a wonderful platform and making sure everything went perfectly smoothly for us. And finally, I thank all of you attendees. These sessions would never be successful without all of you. Hope you all find this useful and hope you continue supporting our sessions. So once again, thank you so much, everyone. And with uh, Gomati ma'am, your permission. Yeah, thank you. Session. We can end the session. Just take care and stay safe. Thank you so much, Dr. Richa, once again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, mind Ray. Yeah. Thank you. Everyone. See you next yeah. week. Yeah, okay. Sure. Yeah. I think we can leave. Thank you.